Springboks too good on the day. And they get the victory and the first win in the rugby championship by 26 points to 10. All right, I've been waiting for this for a fair while. He's such a good old mate. Andy Campistani, a broadcaster, writer, raconteur, commentator out of Africa. Welcome back to the program, me old China. Lovely to hear your dulcet tones, and particularly lovely to hear them with the news that New Zealand is now fifth ranked in the world. Oh, you started early, didn't you? I mean, I just thought we'd be gentle with each other here. Go and whack us, kick us straight in the ghoulies, nuts, whatever you call it in South Africa. You must have a word for it. Um, yes, but I couldn't use it because there'll be people who can speak Afrikaans listening to you right now. Um, but I do, I do have a, a, a motto, which is if you see an Australian or a New Zealand lying on the ground, kick them because they won't be down for long. Well, OK, this particular all-black side, though, I would disagree with you. Five losses out of six, Andy, and the really worrying thing for us is that of those five losses, we haven't looked like winning any of those games. The game on the weekend wasn't even close. You know, the scoreline absolutely reflected it. Yeah, uh, certainly in my time of uh, covering New Zealand South Africa games, I've never seen a worse performance. Um, uh, To put it into context, I think that South Africa are very good at the moment. Uh, They've got depth in every position. Uh, If you consider a few years ago, if your number one scrum half had lasted 43 seconds and the guy coming off the bench had to play the whole game, you'd have thought, well, that's going to break the systems. Well, clearly it didn't. Um, Jaden Hendricks had probably had his best game in a green jersey and uh, everybody stepped up and and, uh, now with uh, a couple of injuries, players not available due to red cards um, people are coming into the squad who actually possibly strengthen it rather than weaken it. So I don't think New Zealand need to get too far down on themselves but having said that, yes, five out of six is a problem Um, and and I I felt uh, as a dispassionate watcher that there were there weren't enough ideas. Uh, it was fairly clear what was happening early in the game, and yet Ian Foster and his coaching staff didn't seem to have a, a a plan B. And that has been the case in both tests at home to Ireland as well. And we were flattered um, by the scoreline in that in that first test at Eden Park, where we scored from broken play. I want to come back to that. You are ruthless and relentless at the moment, but also might I say predictable. We knew what was coming. We knew you would smash into rucks. We knew there would be box kicks. We knew that you would try and out-muscle us. We knew that you would slow the game down and sit down with injuries, which is all, you know, stuff that is 101 how to win a test match. Oh, no question about that. But, I mean, I always go back to John Landry, the legendary coach of uh, of uh, the uh, New York uh, team in Gridiron. He had a, a linebacker called John Riggins, who in South African speak would be a crash ball centre. And before a big game, he would say... That's the only thing I'm going to do. And if you can't find a a reason to to stop me doing that, I'm going to carry on doing it. And I think that that's where this South African side is at the moment. Everybody knows um, how they're going to play. The British press in particular are calling them boring. But there's one thing calling them boring and another thing finding a way to beat them. And and I think that uh, the, the fundamental change was when Rassi Erasmus, during the World Cup, decided to go for that 6 2 split on the bench. He knew that he had two type fives that were as good as anybody else's type fives in the world. And going forward, every team that faces the Springboks is going to have to front up to that issue. They are going to get, in the words of Jake White, they're going to get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed until they can't be squeezed anymore and then they fall over. Very perceptive as always, Andy Capistano out of South Africa for us because this unusual situation where you have front rowers and you say to them, go 30 minutes to hell for leather, bash, smash and we'll pull you off after 30 minutes that's all we actually need. No other rugby team in the world has even tried to do that yet, yet it is working for the world champions. Why won't anyone else run after you and and actually start copying? What seems like a, a really weird idea but it's working. Yeah, and, um, and, and it's, a, uh, it's a basic shift. Um, and the most important thing is that we now have a training squad of 40 players, um, all of whom buy into the same process. So, for instance, when Malcolm Marks ran out as the starting hooker on Saturday to win his 50th cap, the debate was around, well, is he a better player than Bongi and Bonambi? And that debate actually is entirely irrelevant because both of them know before the game starts, that they're both going to get uh, an equal share of humiliating the opposition. And it was felt 
um, by the coaching staff that for the first half, it was better to have Marx's better skills over the ruck ball than it was to have Bongi and Bonambi's better skills, perhaps as a broken field runner and as a scrummager. And it's a wonderful thing to have both of those options available to you, and possibly this coming week, Marx will be on the bench, and Bongi and Bonambi will start. But it really won't make a great difference to the way that the, that the side plays. Andy Capistano on the platform out of South Africa for us. Is there is there some shade and Freud attached to this? Uh, that the fact that look, it was only a number of years ago you lost fifty seven nil in North Harbour. Uh, we didn't actually consider that you know you were that much of a threat. We decided to give you Super Rugby teams the boot because we don't need you anymore. And yet all of a sudden now you're doing to us what we used to do to teams: just out muscle teams, strangle teams, suffocate teams. I don't care if it's boring, and I find it very amusing that ten man rugby England would accuse anyone else of being boring. It's called winning. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. But I, I think, I mean, you mentioned the start of broadcast and now about Super Rugby. And I, I think there are a few people in New Zealand who need to hang their heads in shame because what has happened is two things. One is that South Africa has gone north um, and, and learnt the ways of the Northern Hemisphere, particularly at the moment, the, the way that Ireland play the game. And you found out at first uh, hand uh, how Ireland play the game. But secondly, and, and this, is a, this is a really crucial one, because South African sides are no longer playing New Zealand sides at provincial level, we are no longer feeling, oh, we have to play the game more like New Zealand. And that is a crucial aspect of the way that South Africa are playing at the moment, and it is only going to get more so. And because New Zealand provincial sides are no longer having to front up to really hard physical South African sides on a regular basis, they don't know what to do at international level when they are asked that question. Andy, do you think, looking at this New Zealand side, and you've watched a lot of All Black rugby over the years, I, you know, I, I wrote a column for a, a thing called uh, an, an, an entity called National Business Review at the start of the year, and I did this in February, and the column was titled "This Current All Black Side Is Not Very Good," and everything that I said came has seems to come come out, and 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 it seems to prove what my theory was, which wasn't, you know, I did not no genius behind it, but I'm looking at our players, and and a lot of us think this as well that none of our players would make the 2011 starting World Cup winning side or the 15 uh, t- winning World Cup side, and that this squad of ours is as weak perhaps as it was in '98, a cyclical thing. We just did a low ebb at the moment. Do you actually agree that this All Black side is just a weak side? Yes, I, I think that's a, a very fair point that they are at a low ebb at the moment and we know that they will come right because your structures are in place. You, you churn out top-class rugby players every year. We know that New Zealand are going to get better and that's why I say kick them while they're down. Don't, don't feel sorry for them because they won't feel sorry for you in the, in the same circumstances. So there is no question that if you look at your youth structures, your under-21 sides, um, you're, you're going to see potential future superstars. The one thing I think that you've got to fix quickly is the tight five. Uh, obviously, Brody Retallick wasn't available, and that made a big difference. But it's, it's probably the front row more than the tight five that is the issue. You've got to, you've got to find somebody uh, to hold the scrum up in the way that Franz Malherbe does at tight end for South Africa. You've got to find somebody to come on uh, in the way that Stephen Kitsoff does in the second half and run all over the place and still scrum uh, at the top of his game. You've got to, you, it's a fundamental of rugby union that you can't play the game without a competitive front row. Yeah, but hang on a second. Go back to 2019 when we left Owen Franks behind because we wanted ball-playing props and mobile props. I mean, that has just backfired on us completely. <laughs> yeah, well, the Franks brothers um, could play the game, couldn't they? Mm. Um, and I've no doubt that uh, your, your your current front rows can also play the game, but there's no question that, that they, they, they probably lost it before they ran onto the field in Nelstrait. And um, and the worry for, for for New Zealand must be that that was Nelstrait. This week it's Ellis Park, and New Zealand teams and, uh, and, and in general foreign sides coming to play the Springboks at Ellis Park worry because it really is a citadel. When you lost 57 nil, 18 months out from the World Cup, you sacked the coach and it worked. Can we do the same? 
And would it resurrect our World Cup campaign for next year? Is it fair to constantly blame the coach? Or how much responsibility do you think that these players, who we've just talked about, Andy, aren't good enough? How much responsibility should they be taking? <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the fundamentals of the game. But while we're on the, the subject of, of the coach, if, if um, John Plumtree is listening, um, you're more than welcome to come back to coach the Sharks, John. You, you left with no good reason from the Sharks, and you now uh, um, at a bit of a loose end, and I felt uh, particularly bad for John Plumtree when he was the one who got the bullet ahead of the head coach, because John Plumtree, you will regret uh, losing him from the system, just as you will regret uh, not playing Super Rugby anymore. Um, you, of course you can't blame the coach because in these days you have an enormous coaching staff. Everybody uh, has a specialization and uh, it's, it's only really a question uh, I find amongst many rugby players of who do they trust? Who do, who do they look to in dark times and say, right, I can go and have a word with him and ask him specific questions. And, and if Ian Foster has lost the dressing room, which is perhaps behind the reason that you're asking me the question in the first place, then he's got to go. Um, particularly if Ellis Park is as ugly as, as many people are expecting it to be. And let's always remember that the All Blacks are capable of an extraordinary performance at any given moment. But we don't think that's going to happen at Ellis Park. I don't see how he can uh, last the rest of the rugby championship if it does get ugly at Ellis Park. Well, it is going to get ugly. I mean, you tell me how it's not going to get ugly. Okay, ugly is a defeat for the All Blacks. I mean, it doesn't matter how it actually happens, but what we're trying to actually pick over here is how on earth can we possibly win this game? Honestly, Andy, I haven't been as defeatist about the All Blacks, I don't think, ever in my life. I, don't, I can't remember going into consecutive test matches thinking, I just don't think we've got the cattle to win this. Well, and, and not only that, but perhaps this is going to be a slightly stronger um, Springbok side because Dwayne Vermeulen is almost certain to come back into the team. And although he's 35, uh, Dwayne Vermeulen is a real talisman of this side. And, um, and, and uh, Jasper Visser, who he is replacing, is one of those left-field selections from Rassi Erasmus that I still feel... Um, is possibly wrong, uh, that, that uh, we have several other uh, eight men in this country who should be in the pecking order above Jasper. But having said that, he had a decent game, as did everybody uh, in Nelspreet. But for Milan coming back into the side is an enormous thing. Um, you will have seen that uh, um, uh, Kirtley Irons has got a four-week ban. So Kanan Moody has been brought into the squad. Now, Kanan Moody has just turned 20. He's a Bulls winger. Um, in, in this kind of Fijian style. He's a big unit and he can do the 100 metres in nine seconds with rugby boots on and that sort of thing. He probably won't be in the, in the starting squad, but he's an example of where South African rugby is at the moment, that our third or fourth choice winger would have been first selection about five years ago when you mentioned that 57 nil drubbing. Oh, right. My God almighty. I mean, I just, I've got nothing, Andy. I mean, I haven't got anything to throw at you, mate. I feel like I've taken my shoes off. The shirt's gone. I've got underpants left if you want me to throw. I've got nothing to throw, mate. I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you've got the Barretts. you you got the Barretts, okay? And, um, and I still wonder why it is that Bowden Barrett is still questioned at fly half. is a decent player. But to my, to my mind... Uh, in front of a pack that's going forward, Bowden Barrett's still the best in the world. Well, okay, he's landed on his head. Did a rinse to get the right uh, punishment? Four weeks, is that enough for that? Well, uh, possibly not. Um, it should have been eight weeks. Um, it's actually largely irrelevant because um, it will um, it doesn't affect the, the Springboks going forward. It's unfortunate for the for the young man. And incidentally, uh, Kirtley Owen um, is the protege of the late great Chester Williams, who coached him at the University of the Western Cape. And yesterday was Chester's birthday, so I'd just like to point that out. Yeah, great. So he doesn't come from nowhere, and and he's not going nowhere. So has this South African... I mean, after you played Wales, did you think that you were going to be this good or that you're going to get better? Are you playing better against us than you did against them? I, I would suggest that they, um, by winning by 16 points in Nelspreet, um, South Africa were at the bottom end 
of the performance curve. Um, they threw away a number of, of really good opportunities. Um, they defended brilliantly. Let's, remem- let's remember that. That uh, tackle by Willemse that uh, stopped the try in the left-hand corner was absolutely magnificent. But I, I think the general feeling was that probably 20 to 25 points would have been a, a, a truer reflection. Um, and, and if they put the same kind of fire on the park at Ellis Park, then I, I don't see the All Blacks keeping it below a 20-point margin. All right, then I'm going to end with this, then. What is more chance of happening, the All Blacks win at Ellis Park or Ian Foster keeps his job? <laughs> All Blacks win at Ellis Park, most, most definitely. Um, <laughs> if they were to win by a late drop goal, um, I, I still don't think that Ian Foster will keep his job.